Good afternoon. Thank you, Terry, for that introduction. I am, again, Don Hendricks from the VCU Autism Center for Excellence. And today I'm going to be talking about the topic of applied behavioral analysis. And the name of this presentation is Applied Behavioral Analysis, Just the Facts. Now, I have been using the principles of applied behavioral analysis with individuals with autism spectrum disorder for between 15 and 20 years. I learned how to use these principles when I was a public school teacher. I worked in a private school. I worked in homes. And now, at a university setting, I use them in a lot of different environments. And what I have found over the years is that there's still a lot of misconceptions about what ABA is and what it is not. So today's presentation is going to be just the facts. So that's going to lead us into our objectives. Our first objective is going to be remove the myths about applied behavioral analysis because as I'm working in schools, as I'm in homes, as I'm interacting with parents, I find that there's a lot of misconceptions still about what ABA is and what it is not. So we're going to remove those myths today. Number two, demonstrate how we all use ABA. For those of you who are sitting out there saying, I don't use ABA, I don't believe it, it's not real, I don't think that I want to use it in my classroom with a, a student with autism, I'm going to discuss with you how we all use it, how it impacts us every single day. Number three, discuss research on ABA and autism spectrum disorders. Number four, discuss the key principles of ABA. And then number five, demonstrate how ABA is used to teach students with ASD. As we go through this, you'll hear me talk some, but I also have some video examples to demonstrate some of these objectives. Now, I do want to point out what I will not be able to do today. We have 45 minutes to an hour together. What I will not be able to do is teach you how to use these principles fluidly and effectively with students and with individuals with autism spectrum. But what I do want to do is give you the facts. So I'm going to start out with those misconceptions. ABA. It is not. It is not only for people with autism spectrum disorder. This is a huge misconception out there. Um, many of us in the field of ASD, whether it's education, psychology, working in homes, whatever we might do, might believe that this was a strategy developed specifically for students or individuals with ASD. That is not true. There is widespread application of applied behavioral analysis. We use these principles um, with a variety of different populations. We use it in public schools all the time. You walk into a general education classroom and you're going to see the principles of applied behavioral analysis. Walk into a preschool classroom, you're going to see the principles of applied behavioral analysis. Walk into a special ed classroom for students with learning disabilities, you will see ABA. But we also see ABA used with other populations. We can use it to help people to lose weight, to stop smoking. We can help them to gain muscles or body mass. Um, so many different uses for it, and we'll talk about some of those today. Number two, ABA is not a strategy that creates little robots. I have heard this a number of times over the years. Oh, I don't use ABA because it just creates a little robot, um, a little guy or girl who only does things in one manner or in one way, and that's not true either. ABA is like any other strategy that we would employ with individuals with autism. We know that this is a population who has challenges with generalizing new skills. When we teach something, if we don't plan for generalization, if we don't teach them different materials, if we don't teach in different environments, if we don't teach them how to say things in different ways, yes, they might be somewhat mechanical. That's not a function of ABA, that's a function of bad teaching, however. So as we work with students with autism, as we work with adults with autism, we have to plan for generalization, um, no matter the strategy we are employing. ABA is not a strategy that applies the exact same strategy to every person. It's not done the same way with every single person. This is, again, another misconception. Um, it's like any other strategy. It must be individualized based on the needs. We know that individuals with ASD are very, very different. This is a very diverse population. It stands to reason for every student, disability or not, autism or not, that we must individualize instruction, and that is especially true for this population because of the diversity. 
So as we use ABA with individuals with autism, it must be individualized. We do not use the same strategy, the same set of techniques for every single person with whom we're supporting. All right, finally, ABA is not only used by people who have a board certification as a behavior analyst. Now, for those of you who are not aware, this is a credential. This is um, a license um, in applied behavioral analysis, and that's what it's called, board certification as a behavior analyst, or you might hear BCBA. Um, certainly, there are some individuals, some students, some reasons why a BCBA would be very helpful and would be necessary. Um, maybe for people who have more extreme behaviors or more challenges with learning, this might be important to have a BCBA on your educational team or within the home helping to develop home programming. But others can learn these principles and can use them and can teach using ABA. And that includes educators, that includes parents, that includes psychologists, that includes OTs, PTs, speech therapists, and so on. Okay, let's talk about what ABA is. It is proven to be effective with individuals with ASD. There, is, there are no ifs, ands, or buts about this at this point. ABA has been demonstrated through numerous research studies to be effective. And I'm going to go over some of that research a little bit later on in this presentation. ABA is able to be individualized to fit the need of the person. Again, I talked about that on the pre previous slide. We can individualize these principles so that we are meeting the needs of the student and we are teaching him or her very effectively or supporting him or her effectively in the home. Finally, ABA is effective with every person. I mentioned earlier we can see the principles of ABA at work in the grocery store, in a general education classroom, at the gas station. Everywhere we go, these principles are alive and well and they are influencing behavior. They are helping people to learn. Um, so it's effective with every single one of us and we can use these principles. We can take these principles and really highlight them and use them anywhere. So whether you are an educator watching this webcast or a parent or a related service personnel or maybe you're a job coach, whoever you are, just be aware you can use these principles with someone with ASD and you can also use them Gosh, I use them with my partner. You can use them with your husband. You can use them um, everywhere. They're very effective, and, and we all do uh, use them and are impacted by these principles. Finally, ABA is used throughout our day every single day. Now, here's another misconception about ABA. Let me first say what it is. ABA is a set of principles that explain how we learn. It's learning theory. And this key word here being a set of principles, I've, I've said that several times on the preceding slide, it is not a single strategy. So very often people will equate ABA to something called discrete trial training or discrete trial instruction. It is not one single strategy, but instead it's a set of principles that we can apply very strategically and metho methodically in different ways and come up with different kinds of strategies and supports. So ABA is not discrete trial training. It is not natural environment teaching. It is not verbal behavior. These all take those principles of ABA and apply them in different ways to teach or support someone um, with autism. However, again, it is not a single teaching strategy. What I want to do now is look at behavioral principles in everyday life. So let's talk about some of the ways that you may have been impacted in the last 24 hours by ABA. Example number one, you drive to the 7-Eleven to get gas. Over the loudspeaker, you hear an advertisement for coffee, and suddenly you decide to buy a cup. Even though you weren't really thinking, I want coffee, or I'm thirsty, or I really need to pick me up right now, suddenly your behavior changes. This is ABA at work. And let me explain briefly what is here that's related to ABA. When you're at the 7-Eleven, there's some downtime. You have to wait while you're pumping gas. Maybe it takes five minutes, maybe it takes seven minutes, but you're standing there waiting. This is an antecedent. There's a setting event here. There's a setting situation here. You then hear the loudspeaker advertising coffee. Another antecedent, this is something that happens before your behavior of buying coffee. You go into the store, you buy a cup of coffee, and it's delicious. It's warm, it picks you up, it makes you happy. 
there's a consequence. In this case, it's a positive consequence or a reinforcement. So therefore, the likelihood that you might go to that 7-Eleven and buy another cup of coffee later on in the week or next week or on another day is pretty high. You've been impacted by ABA in this situation. Now, as we go through this presentation, I'll explain those principles a little bit more so you understand them a little better. Second example, you attend a training on ASD after work hours. Well, here you are today watching a webcast on ABA. You could be home. You could be doing other work. Uh, you could be taking a nap. You could be taking a walk on this beautiful spring day, but instead you're watching a presentation on ABA. Well, why are you doing that? You're not doing that for absolutely no reason. There's some benefit you're getting out of it. Perhaps you're learning more about autism so you can be a more effective teacher for your students. Perhaps you're learning more about ABA so you can work, uh, support your child at home more effectively or help them with communication more effectively. There's a benefit, a reinforcement that you're getting, which is why you're listening to this today. Example three, your parents are coming for a visit so you spend the day cleaning your house. Well, I don't know of too many people who like spending the day cleaning house. I am one of those people. I certainly don't like it, but I'll tell you if my parents were coming in this weekend, I would do that. I would stop and do that, even on a beautiful spring day like today. So why would I do that? Well, it's applied behavioral analysis at work. There's an antecedent, my parents coming to a visit, that is triggering my behavior to clean my house. There's a consequence here. And maybe I want to avoid my mother telling me how dirty my house is or how cluttered it is or she can't believe I live in such squalor. Maybe that's what I'm trying to avoid, which is why I clean my house. Or maybe what I'm trying to do is seek some sort of reinforcement from them or some sort of praise even from them saying, wow, your house is so clean. How do you keep it so clean um, with everything you have going on? So those are the principles of ABA. There's just three different examples that maybe you are familiar with as well. Now let's go over another example. You are in the grocery store and waiting in line to check out. Your child spots the candy bars that are directly at his eye level and begs for you to buy one. You decide to buy the candy because you know he may scream and cry and you're tired and you just don't have the energy to deal with it. Now there are many principles in this example and many of you, especially those of you who are parents, have been in this exact situation. Let's be clear, the fact that those candy bars are at eye level, that's an ABA principle at work. Um, organizational management, behavioral management, all those things, um, dealing with organization and businesses, ABA is a very um, set foundational um, strategy that's used in businesses and helping with advertisement and to sell, sell you products and those kinds of things. So that's very much on purpose. Um, the fact that your child starts to beg, here's an antecedent to your behavior. Your behavior is you buy the candy bar. His begging is leading you to buy that candy bar. You didn't buy him a candy bar for no reason. You bought it because he was begging for it. When you bought him the candy bar, guess what happened? The begging stopped. You were then reinforced by buying that candy bar. The fact that you're tired, you've had a long day and you don't have the energy to deal with him getting upset and crying and screaming, that's what's called a setting event. It also sets up the behavior. So there's a lot of principles here that's leading to you buying that candy bar that you may not even be aware of. But again, ABA principles in everyday life. What we're going to do now is look at a video. And this is a video created by Autism Training Solutions, um, a company out of Hawaii that provides uh, different types of training on evidence-based practices with autism spectrum disorders. So let's pause for just a minute and take a look at their overview of applied behavioral analysis. The definition of applied behavior analysis is the application of behavior laws to change socially significant behavior to a meaningful degree. Although ABA has recently received a lot of attention for being used for children with autism, it has been used for decades to solve many types of behavioral problems. When you watch a show at an animal park, you might consider what the whale and trainers had to do to prepare for the show. 
The whale had been trained many hours by animal trainers who used the methods of applied behavior analysis, such as shaping, differential reinforcement, and positive reinforcement. ABA is used to teach skills to many populations. It's used in general education classrooms as well as special education classrooms. It's used by businesses to increase employee performance and customer satisfaction. It's also used to change people's behavior in regards to their health and fitness, to name a few. How do you recognize an ABA procedure or program? There are defining characteristics of ABA that make it what it is. Applied behavior analysis is the field of psychology concerned with analyzing and modifying human behavior and solving socially significant problems. ABA focuses on changing behavior rather than labels, cognition, or personality. For example, ABA will not decrease autism, rather it can be used to decrease behavioral deficits and excesses associated with autism. For some children with autism, self-stimulation is a behavior that interferes with learning and socialization. Behavior analysts would use a behavior reduction procedure to decrease the child's self-stimulatory behavior in situations where he can learn and socialize. ABA relies on procedures based on principles of behavior that have been founded on more than 40 years of research across diverse populations. ABA emphasizes the modification of environmental events to change behavior. Data is taken on observable events and analyzed. Once the variables that are controlling the behavior have been identified, they are modified in such a way that the behavior increases or decreases. In the case of Grayson, his STEM behavior decreased as appropriate play behaviors were taught. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that and you got to see some of the applications of ABA. Again, it's used in many different ways and certainly not just with children with autism. So let's get into now what is ABA. And I'm going to hit you right now with a very heavy definition. But this is the formal definition. ABA, the process of systematically applying interventions based upon the principles of behavior to improve socially significant behaviors to a meaningful degree and to demonstrate that the interventions employed are responsible for the improvement in behavior. What? <laughs> what was that? Wow, that's a mouthful. That's pretty heavy. So let me break that definition down for you. First of all, for it to be a applied behavior analysis, the first component of this, applied, that means systematic. We are going to do it in a method, um, a, an organized, structured way so that it is done systematically so that we know the interventions that we're applying and whether or not they are effective. We're not just going to do interventions willy-nilly and just throw different things at the child or at the person and see what sticks and see what works. Instead, we're going to do this systematically. Um, we're going to apply something, collect data on it, analyze that data, make determinations on whether it's working, and then make adjustments based on those decisions. If it's working, great. We continue on with it. If it's not working, gosh, maybe we'll do some more of it or we'll change it up a little bit in some way. But what we're going to do then, if we look at that last bullet, is demonstrate that what we're doing is working. That's the analysis part. So when I say applied behavior analysis, applied means um, we are going to apply this systematically. The analysis part really looks at we're going to make sure what we're doing is working through data collection and analysis. So let's look at that behavior piece. We're going to apply principles of behavior, and I'm going to talk about what those principles are throughout the remainder of this presentation. And then finally, if we put all three of those terms together, applied behavioral analysis, what we're really talking about is working on socially significant behaviors. We're working on behaviors that are important and meaningful to that person. We're not working on meaningless behaviors. I'm not just trying to get someone to um, I'm not trying to get a 21-year-old to touch his nose when I say nose. 
that is meaningless. That does not help him in his life. But what I might do instead is teach the 21-year-old how to make a sandwich or how to do a job or how to uh, punch his time clock at work. I'm going to do something meaningful. Um, I might teach someone how to greet. I might teach someone how to take turns in conversation or how to write an essay at school. Those are all socially significant behaviors, meaningful behaviors that will help the life of the person with autism in this case. So the next question I want to ask is why do we use ABA? What is all of this um, attention and focus on ABA? You um, go into websites, you um, are on TV or open a magazine or open the newspaper, you might see something about ABA and that's for good reason. Um, it's because it is so effective with this population, but we can use ABA, number one, to increase skills. And I really want to stress, our primary use of ABA is to increase skills. Um, when we say applied behavior analysis, when we use that term behavior, what we're really thinking about are those skills that we want to see that student, that child, that adult to learn and to start using. Often when we think of this term behavior, we think about things like hitting and kicking and screaming and crying. Yes, indeed, those are behaviors, but what we're talking about here really is a more general term of skills. So we can use ABA, number one, to increase skills. So let's look at some different examples. Ty will write three paragraphs about Thomas Edison. We can use ABA to help him learn how to do that. Jackson will take turns while having a conversation. Communication is a real struggle for our individuals with ASD. We can use ABA to teach conversational skills. Shauna will request to use the restroom. Socially significant, very important. We can teach her to request to use the restroom. And Oh, by the way, we can also teach her to use the restroom and to be independent, to wash our hands afterwards and do all of those skills associated with using the restroom. Jamal will find his locker and get the books he needs for his next class. Again, we can use these principles of ABA to teach him how to do all of these steps. Can you imagine the number of steps involved in leaving a classroom, going to your locker, putting away materials, getting away the books and notebooks that you need for your next class and then moving on to your next class. A lot of different steps, but guess what? We can use ABA to teach all of those skills, all of those behaviors. Why else do we use ABA? Yes, we can use ABA to reduce behaviors. So let's look at some examples here. Austin will ask for help versus screaming out loud when he needs help. So in this case, we would rather see Austin not scream when he needs help in the classroom so we can use ABA to teach him a more appropriate way to ask for help. Brandon will wait in line instead of pushing his peers. So think about this. Brandon is waiting in line at the cafeteria and he starts pushing his peers because he's hungry and he wants to get to the front of the line. Well, this isn't a behavior we want Brandon to increase. We want this to decrease. And so what we can do is teach him how to wait in line instead of pushing his peers. Maddie will listen to a peer versus talking nonstop about ponies. Now Maddie really likes ponies and so when she approaches a peer it's on and on and on about ponies and what kind of ponies and what sizes and um, all the different reasons why she likes ponies and all kinds of facts about ponies. This isn't a great behavior to make friends and to socialize with her peers. So therefore we can teach her to listen and we can teach her to take uh, turns in conversation instead of talking nonstop about ponies. We can use ABA to do this. Now I could go on and on and on and pro provide you with a lot of examples of how you can use ABA, but this will give you a little taste for how you may use it with your child or with your students. Okay, we're going to move now into the research on applied behavioral analysis. Now what I have done in just a few slides is try to summarize uh, some of the research that's out there on ABA. There is a tremendous amount of research and I could literally spend this entire hour summarizing that research for you. So I have really cut it down just to kind of give you a taste of what is available. Um, one of the first reports I want to highlight is something that was done in 2001. This was one of the first reports, a seminal report, 
on autism and how do we effectively educate students with autism. Now at the time this report came out, a decade ago, a little bit over a decade ago, the research on autism was in a bit of a mess. Um, we had a lot of different researchers looking at interventions and strategies, um, applying different strategies. There was a lot of controversy in the field. And so one of the things this, this report did is it really kind of took a global look at that research and put it down on paper as to what was effective and what needed to happen, what supports and so on needed to be in place for young children under the age of eight with autism. If you have not read this report, you can actually Google this and find this free online. So I would encourage you to do so. Even though it was written um, over a decade ago, it's still very pertinent and very relative today. But it was one of the first reports to say ABA is effective and we need to be using this with our individuals with autism spectrum disorder. It should be a part of their educational program. The second bullet, the National Standards Project. This was something done in 2009. It was a report developed by the National Autism Center. And you can also get this free online. So again, you can Google this and find this particular document if you do not have it already. And it provided a report on evidence-based practice and autism in the schools. And it outlined, again, it kind of looked at a comprehensive global look at research and practices with autism and it looked at what is considered to be evidence-based and summarized those. What a great and tremendous resource if you do not have this already. So take a look at that and what you will find, ABA is highlighted within this report as being effective with this population. Now there are over a thousand peer-reviewed uh, publications in journals. Um, too many to mention, um, too many to discuss today. Um, but these peer-reviewed journals are um, summarizing how ABA is used to teach a breadth of skills. We went over a couple of slides ago different um, skills that we can use, whether it's approaching a peer, talking to a peer, using a restroom, um, waiting in line at the grocery store, uh, making a sandwich, whatever it might be, we have seen um, ABA being applied in a number of different journal articles. Now the U.S. Surgeon General has issued a statement on ABA. 30 years of research demonstrated the efficacy of applied behavioral methods in reducing inappropriate behavior in an increase in communication, learning, and appropriate social behavior. Now that's a strong endorsement. The American Academy of Pediatrics has issued a statement. The effectiveness of ABA-based intervention in ASDs has been well documented through five decades of research by using single subject methodology and in controlled studies of comprehensive early intensive behavioral intervention programs. Um, I'll let you take a second and read the rest of this, but it goes on to talk about how it's been used to show substantial gains in IQ, language, academic performance, adaptive behavior. Um, adaptive behavior would include things like um, feeding oneself, grooming, toileting, um, moving around uh, your environment or navigating um, in your environment independently and those sorts of things. So it has again been demonstrated to be effective and is endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And now what I want to do is move into more about the principles of ABA. So what is this thing called ABA? Um, ABA makes a couple of different assumptions, and let's talk about those first. It makes the assumption that behavior is learned. Behavior, remember those skills that I'm talking about, it doesn't happen for no reason. We're not talking about a reflex here. We're not talking about a tick. We're talking about learned behavior. And it's learned because it's impacted by what happens before it and what happens after it. Those are called antecedents and consequences. And we're going to talk about that um, and those components, what happens before and what happens after in a little more detail in just a minute. And then finally, all behavior has a function. It serves a purpose for the person, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. Let's go back to those examples that I provided earlier for you on how we use ABA in our own lives. Remember when I mentioned being at a training on autism after work, after a long day, utilized as the principles of ABA. 
you're doing that behavior for a reason. If you weren't getting something out of it, whether it's increased knowledge and skills to more effectively serve your students, or whether it's recertification points towards your teacher licensure, or whether it's um, knowledge to be able to help your child to communicate, whatever it is, it's serving a function, so you're engaging in that behavior. Um, so these are our assumptions. Um, one of the things I'll mention before moving on to the next slide is with ABA, we can also use the term operant conditioning. In other words, there are stimuli or events in the environment that shape, that mold our behaviors, that change our behaviors over time. Um, so that's another term that you may have heard when it comes to ABA, but that directly links back to bullet two, which is behaviors impacted by what happens before it and what happens after it. With that, our behavior is shaped and we start changing our behaviors, developing new skills over time. All right, what I want to do now is show you two different videos. And these are both videos of young children with autism spectrum disorder. I want you to view both videos, and then when we come back, I want you to think about which one was ABA. Which one used the principles of ABA? And I know we haven't really talked about all of those yet, but I've given you a lot of different examples. But before we go into those principles, which one used ABA, which one did not? Or maybe as you look at both of them, you might say both of them were ABA. But see if you can figure it out and see if you see any principles of ABA at work. So take a minute to view these videos. Give me the cow. Cow, you did find it. That was really nice. Here you go. And here we go again. Get the pan all the way over to this side of the table. Look, I'm going all the way to the left. Give me mom. Whoa, I'm so excited for you. That was really, really nice. We've got one more. Here we go. I hope you enjoyed those videos. Let's talk about them briefly. The first video was of a little child doing what's called discrete trial instruction or discrete trial training. That means the same thing, discrete trial instruction. Um, you saw a very back and forth pattern. The instructor would provide some sort of instruction, the child would respond, and then there'd be a consequence or some sort of praise or some sort of um, tangible given to the child. That is a strategy that yes, if you said yes, that's ABA, you are correct. That was ABA at work, using um, what comes before the behavior and what comes after the behavior to change the child's behavior. In other words, to build his skills. So that was ABA. That's just one example though. Guess what? The second video you watched was also ABA. Now that may come as a shock to some of you, although I imagine a few of you realize that that was ABA as well. What you saw in that session was an early childhood special education teacher um, doing what's called natural environment teaching with a young child with autism. Now those two sessions looked extremely different, didn't they? Yet, both sessions were teaching new skills to a young child with autism. So some of the things that you saw in that video is number one, 
um, you saw the antecedents or what came before the behavior as toys being presented, musical toys. The teacher saying, hey, do you want to listen? Do you want to play with this? Come over here. Listen to this. This is fun. There were a lot of antecedents in there going on that kind of enticed the child. You saw him look at it, and then he came over and started hitting it and playing with it. Even when he walked away, he was enticed to come back because the teacher kept making the musical noise that he liked so much. When he would request by saying please or more or music, when there was a request made through his signing, he then got to play with that item. That was his reinforcement. That's what came after the behavior. So two very different looks, but ABA present in both of those. Okay, let's now talk about those key principles of applied behavioral analysis. So you remember when I said one of the assumptions is that behavior is shaped or impacted by what comes before it or after it? Here's our three-term contingency, or what might be called the ABC contingency. The antecedent is the item that comes before a behavior. A consequence is the item that comes after the behavior. And we're going to break all three of these parts, these pieces apart, so that you understand them a little better. But if you understand all three of these pieces, then you really are getting a good grasp on, on those key principles of applied behavioral analysis. So with our three-term contingency, we're going to start with behavior first. Remember, I mentioned when I say the word behavior, I'm talking about any skill, any behavior that we're wishing to increase or decrease. So all of those skills that we're wanting to see. We're wanting to see um, Ty write an essay and to increase the number of paragraphs he writes in his essay. We're wanting to see another student take turns in conversation. We're wanting to see another student wait in line. We're wanting to see another student learn how to request a cracker. We may want to see another student um, be able to board a bus and ride a bus safely. I could go on and on and on, but those are the behaviors we are talking about. Now, a behavior is anything an organism does that can be defined, observed, and measured. It's the movement. Now, key terms here can be defined, observed, and measured. Do you remember in the analysis part of our applied behavioral analysis, I need to be able to collect data on it to know if that behavior is changing. If I can't see it, if I can't hear it, I can't take data on it, I can't analyze it. And so this goes back to our definition of what a behavior is. I need to be able to define it very clearly so that I can observe it and measure it. Let's look at examples to clarify this a little bit. Let's look at examples of behavior. Counting to 10. I can hear that. I can hear a student count to 10. That's a behavior. Saying, I want a pretzel. Saying hello to the principal. Those are all behaviors. Writing a three-page essay. Taking a deep breath. Crying. Hitting. Now, some of these are positive behaviors and behaviors we would want to see increase, and some of these are considered to be interfering behaviors or what some might call negative behaviors and behaviors we would want to see decrease. But these are all examples of behavior. Now let's move on to the first part of that three-term contingency, the antecedents. The antecedent is an event which comes before a behavior. Antecedents are what set up or set off. They trigger the behavior. They come right before the behavior, so when that antecedent occurs, then that's when that behavior occurs. Now, there are different types of antecedents. Um, what we're not going to talk about today is something called setting events, but that's also something that comes before the behavior. But different types of antecedents include um, internal states. For example, if I'm tired today, if I'm being impacted by allergies. If I suddenly come down with a head cold, that's an internal state that might impact my behavior. The structure of the environment. Think about it. Do you have different behavior in a library than you do on the baseball field? Do you have different behavior in a food court than you do in a concert? Um, 
Of course you do. The structure of the environment, what's going on in that environment, changes your behavior. So that can be an antecedent. So suddenly, if you're outside and things are really noisy, um, I was at VCU this morning, I'm outside, I'm walking to the library, there's students everywhere, there's lots of noise, I can talk on my phone, so I can have that behavior, but as soon as I walk into the library, it's quiet. I change my behavior, I put the phone away, and I get quiet. My behavior immediately changed based on the environment. Next, an antecedent can be a support provided to the student. Um, many of our students ne do need a variety of different supports. Um, maybe it's a visual picture um, showing him how to take turns in conversation or a visual card that says wait that helps him understand I need to stand here and wait in line for 30 seconds before I'm able to go get my lunch. Um, perhaps it's an augmentative communication device or um, a computer so he can type on the computer instead of handwriting, but many of our students need different types of supports, and those can also be antecedents. The instruction delivered to the student and the instructional cues we provide, and I'm going to go over some of those examples, are antecedents. And then finally, the communication support provided to the student can also be antecedents. So for example, if I have a student who does not interact with his peers in class. So this student is in a fifth grade classroom, general ed classroom, but he does not interact with his peers. If I provided a support, so in other words, I paired him with a peer in the classroom who has a strong personality, who's outgoing, and who really likes this person with autism, I've all of a sudden created a communication support, and guess what? That child's behavior with autism is likely to change he's now likely to interact with that peer because I've provided a support. Let's look at some antecedents. The antecedent. Juan sees a peer play with a basketball. Juan asks if he can play too. The antecedent, what came before the behavior, is Janie hears the school bell ring. The behavior Janie packs her books and goes to her next class. The antecedent. Jamal's teacher tells him to line up for lunch. The behavior. Jamal gets his lunch and lines up. The antecedent. Tom's stomach growls. Remember when I said an antecedent can be an internal event? Here's an internal event. So Tom's stomach growls. Tom gets up and gets some chips to eat. The antecedent. Teacher gives a direction. Oh, the behavior. The student yells no. Now, here's an example of an interfering behavior or one that we may not want to see increase. We might want to see that decrease and, and teach him to do something more appropriate. But both positive and interfering behaviors have antecedents. And so here's an example. In the last one, teacher gives a math worksheet. In the behavior, student puts his head down on the desk. And so as we talk about antecedents, I mentioned earlier, my job today is not to help you understand how to use ABA with your students, but to give you that global view of what ABA is and what ABA is not. But one of the things to remember with antecedents, they are extremely meaningful and powerful. So the more you can understand what antecedents are at play in the environment with your students or with your child or with anyone uh, you support, then the more effective you can be at providing instruction and support. We can address these antecedents to change behavior. So let's, look, let's take some examples from this slide and talk about that. On the bottom two, we have teacher gives a direction and the student yells no. Well, what if instead of the teacher, the teacher giving a verbal direction, Instead, the teacher gives a direction paired with a visual card that has the direction written on it. This likely could change the child's behavior so he doesn't yell no, but instead he now understands what he needs to do and he complies and follows through with the direction. We've changed the antecedent, so we've changed the student's behavior. The next example is teacher gives a math worksheet and the student puts his head down on the desk. Well, we can alter that antecedent. So instead of giving the student a math worksheet with 15 problems on it, and all the problems are really hard and overwhelming, and this student doesn't like math anyway, we can alter this antecedent. How can we do that? Well, maybe instead of giving him a worksheet with 15 hard math problems, we give him a worksheet with four problems. The first problem is a review problem. 
an easy one. Let's give him something really good and strong that he can be successful with. And then the next two or three problems are a little harder. They gradually get harder, and we ease him into doing something a little more challenging. By giving him only four problems instead of 15, it's less overwhelming. We've changed the antecedent, so his behavior might not be to put his head on the desk, but instead to complete the math worksheet or at least attempt it. Or maybe even ask for help along the way. So we can address antecedents and change behavior. Um, Janie hears a school bell ring and Janie packs up her books and goes to her next class. Um, let's say that Janie is often late for her next class because waiting for the bell to ring um, is just too late for her to get her things together and transition and move on. Well, we can change that antecedent by the teacher giving her a two-minute warning. Janie, you have two minutes before the bell's going to ring. Can you start getting your things together? So there's just a number of ways that we can look at these antecedents and change them and alter them so that we can change behaviors and we can increase skills in our students and our loved ones with autism. Um, real quickly, before I move on to consequences, uh, when I very first started using applied behavioral analysis a number of years ago, um, I was really heavily taught how to use consequences, how that really impacted behavior. I wasn't given as much information about antecedents and how I might be able to use antecedents to really impact behavior too. So one of the things, as you're learning about ABA and as you're applying it, don't forget about these oh-so-powerful antecedents and the impact they can have on behavior. Um, these are part of the ABC equation. What comes before the behavior impacts it, just like what comes after. So don't forget about how you can alter or change these antecedents to help um, the student learn. I'm going to give you one more example real quickly. It was actually an example that I encountered yesterday with an early childhood special ed teacher right here in Virginia. Um, this is a teacher in southwestern Virginia, and she was working on increasing on-task behavior for her little guy, her little four-year-old with autism. And so she had created a little work system for him. And she was telling me the story about how she had basically had been giving him a different instructional cue every time it was time for him to start working. So sometimes she would say, okay, let's get started. Sometimes she would say, all right, you know what to do, go do it. And sometimes she'd say, it's time to work. And she was wondering why she was having such a hard time. Every time she gave him the instructional cue, he would look at her like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. And just wait until she finally had to physically prompt him to get started on the work that was pretty close in proximity to him. Well, she finally realized that her antecedent, her instructional cue, was varying too much. This was a little guy who didn't have a lot of expressive language. He can say some single words. His receptive language um, his understanding of language was pretty delayed. And so what she ended up doing is using only one antecedent, or one instructional cue. So what she started saying consistently was, it's time to work. And so every time he then heard, it's time to work, he knew he needed to get the bin and complete the work in that bin, finish it, put it back in the basket, and then go on to his next activity. And that's a very simple fix. Life is not always that simple, but it's a great example of how these antecedents can be so powerful. A little guy with limited receptive language, limited understanding and comprehension of, of language, by looking at the antecedents that this teacher was using, she was able to make a big difference in his learning of this important skill. Okay, let's move on to consequences. This is what comes after the behavior as important as the antecedents. A consequence, any stimulus condition or environmental event that immediately follows a behavior. Keep in mind that a consequence can cause a behavior to either increase, decrease, or remain constant. Now, it depends on the nature of that, of that consequence. It depends on what it is. Is it something really positive that the person likes and wants to encounter again? Is it something that they don't like and they never want to encounter it again? Or is it something that's, mm, it's okay, I could take it or leave it. So we have to think about those consequences and the impact it's going to have on behavior. Let's take today's training, for example. We said that one of the ways that you use ABA is attending a training on autism after work hours. 
If you find that you get a lot of information from this webcast today, that this was the best session you've ever seen, this thing just increased your knowledge tremendously, it likely will increase your behavior. You may tune into more of our webcasts, or you may even go online and see what else ACE has to offer. You might look at some of our archived webcasts because you want to learn more about autism and how you can support individuals. If you find that you got absolutely nothing, you fell asleep, this was the most boring webcast you've ever had in your entire life, you may never tune into another webcast, or you would have to be really coerced to do so. It would have to be something really extremely interesting, a topic of interest for you to change your behavior. So if this was you know, something not helpful for you at all, it might decrease your behavior. You know what? I am not going to waste my time with participating in that training anymore. Now, if this was something that you got one or two nuggets of information, oh, it was okay, I know a lot about ABA already, and, and this was okay, then perhaps your behavior would remain constant. So you'd attend some webcasts, but maybe you wouldn't attend all of them, um, but your behavior would remain constant. So we can see by those consequences how our behaviors can change or can be altered. Now, one of the terms that we apply with consequences, one of the most effective terms, is reinforcement. With reinforcement, we all benefit. Perhaps you have types of reinforcement that you benefit from as well. As a matter of fact, I know you do. Perhaps it's not the reinforcement being shown in this particular slide, but you have something that motivates you. Do you receive a paycheck? If you do, then you are being reinforced and it's altering your behavior. It's one of the main reasons why you would get up every morning and go to work and work as hard as you do because of that reinforcement. Now, there might be other types of reinforcement. If you're an educator, watching your children learn, seeing them grow, working with parents, um, building skills, seeing a child go from being nonverbal to now being able to request 10 different items. That's another type of reinforcement. But we all have different types of reinforcement. I want to go back to the slide real quickly and uh, point out that this is a picture of my mother. Um, she does not yet know I'm using her today in this presentation, so I'll have to send it to her at the conclusion. Okay, let's talk about reinforcement because this is really one of the most critical um, elements of applied behavioral analysis, how we use reinforcement. Reinforcement increases the likelihood that the behavior will occur again in the future. Now, many of us, all of us, have heard this term reinforcement, and we all probably use it. I know I was guilty of this. Um, go back 18 years ago when I was first trained on applied behavioral analysis. Someone would say, do you reinforce your students? And I would say, yes, of course I do until I really learned what applied behavioral analysis was and what the true definition of reinforcement is. And then I'd have to say, well, no, what I'm probably doing is just providing a break or a, re or a reward. So let's uh, understand that distinction a little bit better here. Reinforcement, again, increases the likelihood the behavior will occur again in the future. In other words, the behavior changes. If behavior is not more likely to occur or not occurring more in the future, it's not reinforcement. Now, this is different from rewards. We all encounter rewards um, in our daily lives. In grade schools, uh, perhaps the student gets a sticker or gets a star on a chart. If that motivates the student and incre increases his behavior to go study for that spelling test or to um, study for that math exam, then we do indeed have a reinforcement because we're changing behavior. If it doesn't impact that student's behavior, I'm sorry, we don't have a reinforcement. That's simply a reward. So there is a distinction between those things that society offers as rewards. Um, sometimes that can be praise. Hey, good job, nice job, I like the way you do that. And sometimes it can be things like stickers. But again, rewards don't change behavior. They may motivate us a little bit, but it's reinforcement that's really going to change behavior. Um, grades. Some students are very motivated by grades, and this acts as a reinforcer. Getting all A's, all A's on a report card is a reinforcer motivating that person to study. For some students, it doesn't impact their behavior at all, and so we have to make that distinction. That's true with our students with autism. I know some little guys and girls who are very motivated by grades and really want to get um, really high marks. Others are not really 
um, either motivated by it or may not even be completely aware of the meaning behind those grades. Um, so we have to look at that piece. Um, additionally, social praise and things of that nature. I know some students who are extremely motivated by social interactions. Hey, good job. Give me a high five. Here's a hug. Um, I love the way you wrote that paragraph. That was awesome. Nice work on that. Um, nice job being on task. I was in a classroom yesterday um, with a fourth grader who was very motivated by praise. He remained on task for long periods of time by his teacher, keeping an eye on him and about every five minutes giving him a, um, some verbal praise, saying, nice job, you're really on task today. You're doing a great job on that paper. However, some of our other students are not motivated by praise and by um, that kind of um, reward, so to speak. So we have to think about that. Um, I say all of this because very often one of the misconceptions that I have not gone over yet with ABA is that our students, that our individuals with autism should be motivated and should be reinforced by the same items that all other students are. And if you remember nothing else today, remember that that's not necessarily true. Our students may or may not be motivated by those same reinforcers that are present for all of our other students in the schools or all other people, for that matter. Um, so as we think about reinforcement, we must think about, number one, what motivates the person, what do they like, what really gets them going and would change their behavior, um, and we must individualize it. I work with a little guy who loves whales, loves whales, knows every fact there is to know about whales. Having the opportunity to get out a book and read about a whale is extremely reinforcing to him. And so we use that to increase his on-task behavior at school, then he gets time to go read about whales. But I can promise you there's not another student in the classroom who would find that motivating. And so we really have to individualize how we use these reinforcers, what we use, how we use them, and how we apply them. Um, reinforcement is needed for all students all ages, all abilities. Um, again, we all are motivated by different items. Um, I mentioned earlier we're motivated by our paychecks or we're motivated by some of the outcomes of our, of our efforts at work, seeing children learn, seeing them grow. We all have reinforcers in our life um, and those reinforcers come in all shapes and sizes. And so that's true for all of our students, whether it's someone with Asperger's syndrome, whether it's someone in um, early childhood special ed or whether it's someone in high school in a general ed AP class, we have to think about reinforcement and we think about how to individualize it and how to make it meaningful for the student. Another note on reinforcement, we have to think about as we individualize it, what skills are really hard for that student or for that person and we want to apply more reinforcement, stronger, better reinforcement for those harder skills. So let's take a person with Asperger's syndrome who's in high school, who's doing very well academically. However, interacting socially is challenging. Perhaps this person makes really rude comments to people. And so learning how to make more socially appropriate or nicer comments, comments that will not get him beaten up in the bathroom, would be a really high priority. Now that's going to be a hard skill for him, so we would really want to identify what kind of reinforcement we could apply as he's learning that new and challenging skill. For the little guy that you saw in the video, um, learning to sign. Learning to sign is a very hard skill for him. So you saw the teacher directly apply reinforcement. As soon as he signed, he got access to that musical toy. And so we want to individualize it. We can use food, we can use drinks, we can use tangible items such as toys. We can use um, activities and breaks. We can use all kinds of things. Reinforcement is only limited by your imagination. A misconception I will break right now, it's not just food and edibles. We can use that with some of our students and some of our individuals. We don't have to use it with everyone, but certainly including it in the mix is often a good thing. Okay, now that we've talked a little bit about reinforcement, I want to show you two different examples of how reinforcement has been applied in a school situation. So you are going to see in the first video an adolescent, a teenager who's being reinforced. Um, this is someone with 
classic autism. And this is a, um, an individual who uh, is nonverbal but has a tremendous capability to communicate, um, is very on task at work, um, is doing high level academic work, and you will see him being reinforced by a token board. In the second video, you will see a young child, a very young child, who is nonverbal and who is reinforced very differently. She's being reinforced by tangible items and by some things that she can eat. So take a look at these two videos and then we'll chat about them. In the library. Oh, okay. What's this one? Just that that is a slide you're working so nicely. What about that? Uh, you got it, my man. There's one token for you. Seth, what's used to tell time? Did you do a a watch! I'm going to give you two tokens. A watch is used to tell time. Nice job. All right. Where can you play outside? You got it. What's this one? What's this one? Computer. Yeah, we're working to go to the computer lab. What's this one? You got it. What number? Seven. And what's this one? Computer. Computer. You have four tokens already. <laughs> Fun puffs. Mm -hmm. Puffs. <laughs> that for her big reinforcement because she gets insane when I I hope you enjoyed those. As I mentioned, in the first video, you saw an adolescent who was being given tokens on a token board. Now, what happens with that token board is when there's a correct response or he's on task, the teacher has defined what kind of behavior she's looking for for him to get that token. He gets a token. When he gets a set number of tokens, he then gets to earn something. Now, in this case, Tom gets to choose what he earns. Tom loves the computer. He also likes um, there's a sensory room that he can go to that he can hang out in a bean bag and look through. He likes videotape covers so he can look through those. Um, he can also go to the gym and run around. He has a choice that he can earn five minutes to go do something very motivating, reinforcing for him. In the other video, quite different. Um, we saw a little girl who was just learning to communicate using pictures. So you saw two different people. You saw a therapist and you also saw a mother and the little girl was being prompted to pick up a picture and hand it over so hopefully you could tell this was a pretty new skill for her so it was pretty challenging the reinforcement was her actually gaining access to fun items so as soon as she handed that picture over to the person she immediately got that rain stick so she could shake it and play with it she immediately got a snack to munch on she immediately got something really fun and motivating so by pairing that reinforcement with her handing it over and dropping that picture in a hand, what she's learning is, I want to hand that picture to someone again and again and again. I get something really great when I hand over that picture. Again, two different ways to provide reinforcement. 
So now um, we are going to move on to looking at putting together this three-term contingency, the ABC contingency, and look at some different examples. So let's look at example number one. Antecedent. The teacher says, do the math sheet, and the behavior of the student begins working. The consequence, teacher provides praise and a token. So you can see how there's something came before the behavior and something came after the behavior. And now the likelihood this behavior will happen again in the future should be high if this is indeed reinforcement. Number two, the antecedent. The teacher is walking on the round, around the room and does not provide any attention to the student. She's talking to other students and she's up at her desk um, working with some papers. The behavior, the student begins yelling, humming, and tapping his pencil. In other words, the student's making a lot of noises. The consequence, the teacher provides attention. So she goes over to Sean and says, stop making that noise. I don't want you to make that noise. What is it that you need? Now, think about this one. Again, there's an antecedent, there's a consequence. Because the student made noise and the teacher came over and provided attention, it's very likely the student was reinforced, so he'll probably do this behavior again in the future. We've now just reinforced an interfering or a negative behavior. Example three, the antecedent. The teacher shows a picture of the next activity coming up in class. The behavior, the student puts away items and moves to the table. The consequence, the teacher provides 30 seconds to look at a favorite book. So we know how challenging transitions can be with many of our students with autism. So in this case, the student puts away his items and moves to the next location. No problem behaviors or interfering behaviors, does what he's supposed to do. And so there's a reinforcement at the end to look at his favorite book for a few seconds. Now, ultimately what we're wanting to change is behavior. If I could make this blink, I would make this blink. We want to change behavior. We want to build skills. We want to build positive skills. Again, those socially significant skills. We cannot do that by only altering the antecedents or altering the consequences. But we must teach the behavior. We must actually show the student, the person, the behavior we want him to do over and over again. Think back to the last video you saw of the little girl taking the picture and handing it over. That had to be taught. We couldn't just set out the picture and then hold up the rain stick. That wasn't enough, but she had to be taught. So how do we teach it? This is another one of our key principles as we look at applied behavioral analysis. We do this through prompting. We actually have to teach the behavior by prompting. A prompt is a cue given to help the student give the correct response. Now in that, in that video that you saw, there were several prompts going on. There was primarily what's called a physical prompt. You saw um, the therapist sitting behind the little girl take her hand, cup it, wrap it around the picture, and then lead it to the mother's hand and help her let go of it. There was a physical prompt to help her to do that. Now, if we continued watching that video and seeing the progress of that child, very likely what we would see is that that physical assistance would fade slowly over time. So as that child is learning to reach for the picture, then what the therapist might do is help push her hand towards mom's hand and help her let go of it. And then as she's starting to uh, reach for the picture, grab it, and go towards mom's hand, then the therapist is only going to help her let go of it until eventually she's not providing any physical assistance at all. At some point, she might move to what's called a gesture prompt, where she simply points to that picture laying on the table. So instead of physically helping her or taking her by the elbow or by the wrist or by the hand, she's simply going to point to that picture as a reminder to that little girl, hey, you can communicate. You can ask for what you want and, and give it a point. Other type of prompts include verbal, where you actually tell the person what to do. So in this case, you might tell her, get the picture, give it to mom. You might say something of that nature. If another type of prompt is called a model prompt, where you show her what to do. Now, I want to caution you about using model prompts with this population because many of our children and students and individuals with ASD do not imitate well. So in other words, to watch you, 
to look at what you're doing, to pay attention to what you're doing, and then to imitate that is a very challenging skill for many of our guys and girls. Um, so be cautious of how you use model prompts because not all of your students, not all of your children will effectively be able to respond to a model prompt. Now, this is difficult for many educators because modeling is probably the number one type of prompt that's used in schools everywhere. Not classes for kids with autism, but general ed classes, um, other types of special education classrooms. We show students what to do. We show them how to spell a word. We show them how to write a letter. We show them how to do a math computation. Modeling may not be the most effective, so we need to rely on some of our other types of promptings, including physical, partial physical, and gesture. Additionally, with verbal prompts, those are very commonly used in schools all over the place, too. We tell people what to do. Well, guess what? This is a disability of language and social. So verbal prompts aren't always the most effective either. So we need to be cautious about how we use them as well. So as we use prompts, we want to kind of pull from our entire arsenal using, again, really heavily relying on some physical, partial physical, and gesture prompts, um, and using verbal and model as they are appropriate with the student. With prompting, um, what this does, it allows a child to learn exactly what to do. Um, as you use these prompts, you also need to think about how you're going to use them and how you're going to fade them. This is a teaching tool. This isn't something we should put in place forever and ever. It is a teaching tool. It should be used to teach the skill we want the child to do over and over again. So as we look at that final behavior chain, this is what it looks like. I mentioned the term setting event briefly earlier. This is something that can precipitate or come before the behavior. It kind of sets up the behavior. Again, that antecedent, what comes directly before the behavior, then that's when we prompt. So if I say, if I hold up a ball and I say, what is it? That's my antecedent. My prompt can then be telling the child, ball, the behavior is the child repeating back the word ball, and the consequence is me um, giving her access to play with that ball for a few minutes or some tickles or something that's just really motivating because she got the response correct. Now, what I want to do is show one final video, and um, this is an adolescent, a teenager um, with autism. And he has just returned from lunch, and he is doing his hygiene routine. So he's just returned from lunch. It's time to wash his face and brush his teeth, all those self-help skills. And what I want you to do, this is ABA being used. And there are many components of ABA. Now, I have chosen a video that's a little non-traditional. This is not a classroom um, instructional session where reading or writing or math is being taught. We can use ABA for all of those skills and do use those for all of those skills. This is a non-traditional skill and I want you to think about all these principles of applied behavioral analysis and see if you can pick them out and determine why this is ABA. Take a look. <laughs> Can I press you 
teeth, bud. Good work. Beautiful work. What's that? Well, all right, man. We are going to brush our teeth and do a little bit of work at the table. And all right, listen. We're going to wash our face with no soap. Go ahead. Okay, so you saw him doing his hygiene routine and in particular brushing his teeth. So let's talk about some of the things that were present. Was there an antecedent? Yes, there was. He had just actually finished lunch. So he had finished lunch. The time of the day is kind of this antecedent that says it's now time in your schedule to do the antecedent. But yet there was another antecedent because the teacher did say it's time for your routine. Go to the sink. She provided him with a couple of extra um, triggers or um, instructions there so that he would know exactly what to do. So Tom walks over and he starts doing his routine and he starts putting, getting out his toothbrush and putting the toothpaste on the toothbrush and doing his routine. And occasionally um, you saw the teacher kind of reach in and provide a slight little prompt helping him to know what to do. Now I want to mention to you, you saw this routine after it had already been taught to him. If you had seen this routine a while ago, you would have seen a lot more prompting, where the teacher was prompting him to pick up the toothbrush, where the teacher was prompting him to get out the toothpaste and squeeze just the right amount, prompting him to put it in his mouth and brush, and do all those other steps. He would have been taught, using those prompts, how to do this routine and how to transition from activity to activity. Um, what you were unable to see, really, is the consequence that happened after this whole routine, where he got a few minutes of downtime to do what he wanted to for doing his routine so independently and so nicely. Now think about it. In this video, what you saw was socially significant behavior. Is brushing your teeth, washing your face, and doing a routine like that socially significant for a teenager? Absolutely. It's a very important skill. What you saw was the use of antecedents and consequences applying and prompting, applying those behavioral principles. What you saw was data being collected. We are applying interventions systematically. We are taking data and we are analyzing that data to make sure what we're doing is effective. So what you saw in that video was ABA. I want to thank you for tuning in today. Um, I want to mention that we will have a chat room available directly following um, this particular webcast, so I hope that you'll choose to join me in the chat room. I'd be happy to um, hear any of your comments and answer any of your questions. Um, thank you again.